I'd like to pick up also cognitive dullness. I haven't heard that phrase before, but it's a very useful... I just made it up. I think Simon's put his finger on something pretty important there. And, and it reminds me of the need to reintroduce a, an ethical flavour to this debate. And I think Clive Hamilton's been trying to do this very successfully. But, you know, all of the world's great religions and ethical systems involve an element of stewardship that we are actually stewards for those who come after us, that we do not own uh, the world's resources, that we are just its custodians, its temporary guardians. All of the world through great religions have elements of that philosophy in them. And I think that's the answer to the cognitive dullness because we all know the boiling frog metaphor. It's a very true psychological metaphor. We get used to anything. We accommodate to anything. We're a very brave and resilient species. But if we can remind ourselves of this obligation we have to be custodians of the planet for those who come after us. I, I think that's the answer. Mm. Let's open it up now. Yes. Okay. The, um, the, Tony, the um, intergenerational equity issue I think is, is huge, but that wasn't the point of my question at the moment. It, it gets back to the communication and getting people to understand. Um, I've just had another colleague return from um, from Shepparton region, and I've had 10 years down there. And of course the farmers, I suppose it's a mis-metaphor, but the farmers are actually at the coalface of all this. They're watching their paddocks desiccate, their stock go hungry. They're communicating when they're living and breathing it, and they still don't understand it. And it's so... I, ju I just cannot understand why what more needs to be done if well, they're going to living, resist breathing, it. visual they're going to resist it, it seems to be the because the their livelihoods and their and their their, their 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 property and their 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 families and their towns uh, they want them to survive so they will they will uh, uh, try to resist uh, the, the kind of messages they're getting I think deep down you've got to say that um, there are a lot of farms in Australia that sadly aren't viable and that's 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 the big problem that, that for these particular farmers, you know, that, that that's everything for them. Everything about that that farm is their identity, it's their family, their community, and that's a really hard pill to swallow. And it's a pill that, that um, most of the rest of Australia doesn't quite have to swallow. Maybe maybe some cities aren't viable because of the lack of water. We don't know that yet, but there are some people that have to swallow it, and other people that don't. Farmers have been the victims of market rationalism, mm. and if I was a farmer. I would be a Trotskyite, or I'd be blowing up coal power stations. I'd be getting very radical indeed. <laughs> they, they have they have really drawn the short straw of market rationalism. It's not just water scarcity. It's the way the market system gives all the water to big corporations like Timber Corp and Great Southern and Cubby Station, which then go broke while small family farms can't afford the water. Market rationalism has pernicious outcomes in the. In the country, right, let's, so. let's get back onto the communication issue. <laughs> Jeff, do you have a question about communication? Yes. Um, okay. Kind of picks up what Tim Will. Will, thanks. Said, um, I think a key is hope <laughs> in, in, in keeping people from shutting down from the bad news. And for example, I pushed the message that in fact it's not going to be so expensive for us to make the transition. Um, there, there's a lot of dispute about this, but even pretty mainstream economists have been saying it, including Ross Garner and, and Lord Stern. Um, so I wonder if you... Look, ab absolutely. Up. I mean, I, I've got a... Um, just touching on the idea of visual visualisation is beautiful, information is beautiful. I've got a great graph um, sitting on my desk of the cost of the recent bailouts compared to the cost of what it would take for us to, um, to deal with climate change. And you know, it's actually a fair bit smaller. It's not that cost worthy. People are resisting it because those costs will probably hit some people rather than others. But it's not that bad. And we, there, are, there are a lot of opportunities, so absolutely. I reckon hope can, should uh, come from the top. If, if Copenhagen uh, comes to a, if at Copenhagen the world does, which I don't expect to, will, comes to a, a sensible and realistic global shared approach, uh, then, uh, and the countries, especially China and, uh, and the US, actually enact what they, what they commit to do over the next two to three years, then um, it probably wouldn't be possible to uh, build a, um, a cognitive um, uh, a, um, breeze for hope. 
in, in constituencies like Australia and around the world. And once you have that, maybe there would be more political will to, 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 to keep pushing. But um, uh, I think uh, what we're going, well, I doubt that, uh, that that will happen, especially in the next month. I believe we can get hope back if we get serious about building a renewable energy based diversified energy system in Australia because that is the one single thing we can do and we can afford to do that will inspire all of us, whatever our politics, whatever our ideological orientation and uh, that, that's under our third heading, Will, I know, but that, that's where the hope come from, comes from for me. Question down the front, yes. Um, I was just going to say that um, traditional conceptions of science about repeatability, certainty, you know, that we have complete you know, theories and ideas about um, phenomenon, climate change actually really challenges that. It's a wicked problem, so-called wicked problem. And so we have to reconceive our ideas about what science is and so deal plausibly with uncertainty. How do we actually you know, come to terms as a nation um, with those kinds of issues and reconstruct our very ideas about what science is and what it can deliver? That's an interesting question. Any I, comments on that? I wish we had a scientist here because I think the <laughs> scientist would say that you were wrong. Um, in fact, science has been dealing with uncertainty and ranges of of uh, bell-shaped curves of probability for a very long time indeed. Um, when you're fishing and, and, and uh, when that odd freak waves uh, blows you, uh, 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 sweeps you off the rocks and drowns you, that's actually the bell-shaped curve at work. So, you know, science is, is very used to dealing with uncertainty and risk and probability. So I, I think I don't agree with the premise. I'd like to answer that because there is a scientist here. Yes. <laughs> 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 I don't know you're allowed to talk. <laughs> well, I'm not, but I'm all the on this one. Well, I think you've raised a very good point, and I think what's happening in science and what makes climate change a wicked problem is that there has been a, a public perception of science and strongly within science a highly disciplinary approach to science. We sit in silos largely in physics and chemistry and biology in the geosciences and so on. Furthermore, a lot of scientists still think in terms of cause and effect. Let's take a piece out of the system. Control everything else, tweak it and see what happens. That's the classic view of science, outside <coughs> science, and still quite common inside science. Climate change is quite different. It's a complex system. It doesn't behave like that. When you put the system together, you get emergent properties, you get tipping elements, you get behavior that classic science doesn't deal well with. So it's challenging the scientific community. So I think you've got a very good point. Uh, but, but it also pertains within the scientific community. Mm. I'll stop there because I don't want to say too much about that. I want to ask Dr. Anaclo again, uh, uh, your comments on that. Um, do you think that the sort of things you're doing are starting to get across this new view of science and, and getting people to become more comfortable with abrupt changes, tipping elements, uncertainties, that this is actually an important part of science that we need to come to grips with? Yes, I, I, I do, I, and I think uh, it's not just, I mean, because climate change science uh, doesn't just involve every form of science, I think it involves and affects everyone, and so the power of art, I mean, if you look historically at, say, for example, 18th century medical science, when religious restrictions uh, disenabled uh, scientists, doctors from actually opening up cadavers and artists were like Michelangelo stealing them uh, out of the graveyard and studying and, and drawing the internal structure of the body. And I think in a way artists have the power of seeing the beauty and the hope and of I mean, all you have to do is open your eyes and see how beautiful nature is. And so expressing that can bring about hope and create audience engagement. And rather than, I agree with the general consensus that if you um, evoke fear, people don't have anywhere to, to turn and so they feel cornered. Whereas I think if you could communicate the science in a way that uh, is interactive and stimulating and visually sophisticated that uh, you can help bring about change and also inform people about those very you know, important uh, scientific, uh, you know, just um, da data sets that are coming out at the moment. <laughs>